The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments are known as the Reconstruction Amendments. All of them involve the rights of the people who had been enslaved before the Civil War, but the amendments went further than that, reconstructing the former slave states, but also the northern states and the federal government itself. Each of the amendments added significant new powers and new limits to the Constitution. Specifically, they created rights not previously found, they imposed significant limits on state governments that were not previously found, and they created new powers for the federal government. This video focuses on the first of the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th. The 13th Amendment was designed to finish the work of President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation of 1863. The proclamation's effect was limited to those states that were in rebellion. That's because it was enacted under the President's military power as Commander-in-Chief. He was not certain that the military power would allow him to eliminate slavery in those states that were still part of the Union. The 13th Amendment, by contrast, would apply to all the states and all the territories, whether or not they had attempted to secede. And unlike a military proclamation, the 13th Amendment would be part of the Constitution itself, putting to rest any potential doubts about the future effect of the proclamation. The 13th Amendment was the first part of the Constitution to explicitly combine an individual right with a congressional power. Let's see how that combination operates. The 13th Amendment, Section 1, created a new individual right, previously unknown under the U.S. Constitution, the right not to be held in slavery. By saying that slavery and involuntary servitude shall not exist anywhere within the United States, this right was effective against both the federal and state governments. The new individual right against slavery would act as a limit against any source of government power that might otherwise be understood to authorize laws on the subject. For example, the federal government has an enumerated power to make laws for the territories, but the 13th Amendment would not allow that power to be used in a way that authorized slavery in the territories. This limitation on the federal government was more theoretical than real, since laws authorizing slavery had all been promulgated at the state level, using state sovereign powers. The 13th Amendment, by saying that slavery shall not exist, limited that state power. In addition to the new right created by Section 1, the 13th Amendment also authorized Congress to pass anti-slavery legislation in Section 2. This was necessary in part because of the Dred Scott decision. The pro-slavery decision in Dred Scott had two principal holdings. First, the court held that African slaves and their descendants could not be citizens of the United States or of any state. Second, the court held that Congress could not forbid slavery in the territories, a decision that effectively overruled the Missouri Compromise of 1820, among other laws. Section 2 of the 13th Amendment responded directly to the second of the Dred Scott holdings, expressly affirming Congress's power to ban slavery in the territories, and indeed to ban it anywhere in the United States, including in states themselves. Section 2 of the 13th Amendment therefore expanded the power of the federal government into a new area, expanding Congress's authority. Of course, when Congress uses its constitutional power to make laws, those laws are supreme over state laws. So the result would be a corresponding reduction in the power of states to enact conflicting laws. One of Congress's first uses of its new 13th Amendment power was the Civil Rights Act of 1866. This law began by announcing that all persons born in the United States were citizens. This targeted the first holding from Dred Scott. The law also guaranteed that certain basic rights that had previously been denied to slaves would now be available to all citizens, regardless of race. President Andrew Johnson vetoed this bill. Johnson, who was a Southern sympathizer, no doubt objected to the substance of the law, but he also considered it to be an improper intrusion by the federal government into the internal workings of the states. The constitutional theory behind the veto was that the Civil Rights Act was not truly authorized by the 13th Amendment, since the amendment involved the elimination of slavery, 
and not regulating the rights of citizens. This approach to Congress's newest enumerated power in many ways resembled the strict construction approach to powers that John Marshall had rejected in early cases like McCulloch v. Maryland and Gibbons v. Ogden. In effect, President Johnson thought the amendment was only about the difference between humans being property and not property. Congress took a broader view, seeing the amendment as authorizing laws that would eliminate conditions that resembled slavery. Johnson's veto was overridden, and the Civil Rights Act of 1866 became law. Subject to various amendments, it remains on the books today. But the veto and the concerns surrounding the scope of the 13th Amendment suggested to Congress that more amendments might be needed. 